Uh, kia ora koutou and welcome to this uh, lecture here tonight on reshaping our political horizons in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And first of all, I would just like to thank Kira at Palmerston North Massey University and Professor Mohan Dutta for inviting me to be part of this series at this time. A brief outline of the contents um, that I'm going to run through tonight is here. Um, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is about scope. I've taken on a huge topic here tonight and of course um, at any given time you can only cover so much and I'll only be exploring some elements here, particularly ones that, that derive from my own experience and background, but also trying to engage with some of the debates that are going on with such vibrancy around the left at the moment, particularly on social media and Zoom, hopefully more face to face in times to come. Nor am I trying to give or create some overall blueprint or manifesto. Creating such visions and imaginaries is up to all of us, not just one of us. Now I'm going to focus on a few areas with which I'm particularly familiar. Just a little bit um, about my own background before I go any further. Um, I've spent a lot of my life working in unemployed workers and beneficiaries organisations, both in the 1980s and 90s. Um, and again, um, in the 2010-2006 to 2006 period with the group Auckland Action Against Poverty. I also had the pleasure of 10 years inside the belly of the beast, inside Parliament, as a Green MP between 1999 and 2009, um, particularly covering, covering areas like welfare, unemployment, uh, community economics, uh, children's issues, ACC, um, industrial relations and so on and that gave me a different perspective on all this and the third part of my background is, is really being that after leaving Parliament I undertook a PhD with Professor Marilyn Wearing at AUT uh, looking at uh, why we don't have a left-wing think tank or a major left-wing think tank in this country um, and alongside that, I did quite a lot of work um, speaking to activists across the academic and uh, non-academic left about uh, the state of the left at, at that time between 2011 and 2013. Um, and a, a lot of my thinking here today is also reflected in that because that thesis experience, that research um, revealed so much about what has fractured and fractionated the left and how, what a big job we've got in front of us to do better. I'm really aware of, the, of how li lively the debate has been in the various conversations I've been in over the past few months. Some of those with friends who are associated with the group I work for, Kotari Research and Education for Social Change in Aotearoa. I'd like to acknowledge all of you who've been part of these conversations. But I've also been on other calls and watched lectures online, um, groups like Action Station and SISI at Community Think, um, this series of lectures at CARE, uh, various threads on social media and so on. There's a lot of thinking going on right now and I think that's great. When Mo Mohan started this lecture series, he asked the question, what are the other kinds of possibilities that we can create? And I think that's one of the questions of our time and it's one we often run away from. We do need to expand our political horizons. In, in some ways I think when we look back and see what's happened with the COVID crisis in the first few months of this year, we will see it as a time of rupture, a time of change between one period of history and the next. And sometimes it's hard to see that when you're in the middle of it. And what I'm doing here tonight is just an attempt to bring at least some aspects of what's happening now together and to consider some of the places where we on the left of New Zealand politics might push the boundaries of what's possible a bit harder. But it's not just policy and program ideas that we need to expand. We also need to strengthen our organisational capacity so that we can develop the strength needed to bridge some of the divides between us and find common cause in pushing for change beyond what we may now conceive as possible. But before I go any further, I think it's probably pretty important to do this. What do I mean by left? This definition is something I 
put together when I was doing my thesis. Um, it took about three months to create these few words, <laughs> as anyone who's tried to create academic definitions will understand. But it, it is a definition, definition I stand by. A commitment to working for a world based on values of fairness, inclusion, participatory democracy, solidarity and equality, and to transforming Aotearoa into a society grounded in economic, social, environmental and tariki justice. It is important to have some kind of common understanding of words, <laughs> um, because um, I, can't, I have no idea who's on this call or who's listening or watching this, and what our definitions can be very different, but this is my starting place, and I hope that will be acceptable to those of you who are on this call tonight. <clears throat> I couldn't help but start when looking at the background context for this discussion, looking at what's happening internationally. This has been a time of huge change. Up until January 2020, I think the climate crisis was on the top of many of our minds. Last year we had this massive um, development of the school climate strikers and other organisations taking action on the streets here in a way we haven't seen before. Wonderful to see a new younger generation of activists coming, about, coming out and saying this is our future and we're determined um, to force change here. It's absolutely essential and it was becoming more and more uh, to the fore um, in terms of consciousness, not just for those outside, but I think in, inside the parliamentary system as well. But then, but then uh, we got hit by the pandemic through the February March period, and, and then suddenly the lockdown. And of course, this became overwhelming. Um, the third, the third part, of course, has been the impact, the economic impact of the COVID crisis, which is rolling out now and has been rolling out for some months already internationally and locally. And then the next thing that happened, of course, we're all very aware, on 26th of May, um, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Now, normally, this ha these terrible black killings happen all the time. And normally, here, halfway across the world, we don't pay so much attention. But the massive uprising, the massive um, mobilisation that's taken place across America through the last um, couple of weeks has been such a response um, that it's very difficult for us not to keep our eyes on the US, um, which for decades has provided such a um, background of the world's financial stability or for parts of the world. Um, it's tended to set the pace in things like culture and tech for countries like New Zealand. Um, it's how could that empire ever fall? But I think what um, a lot of us are aware of now is that we're starting to see something that might be beginning to crumble, to change, and how that change rolls out, none of us knows. And of course, we send all our best wishes to the people over there who are trying to make change. Um, but whether Trump stays or go, he's a symbol, and America won't necessarily be fixed if he goes, and we need to bear that in mind. <clears throat> If America continues to implode, it will have an impact on the rest of the world, including us. And it has been great to see the impact of the Black Lives Matter protests in America and the effects they've had in all sorts of ways already. And I think there's much more to come. So turning to our own country, I think we probably all share this feeling that um, the health response that the government's taken to the COVID crisis has been um, about as good as it could get. Um, internationally, um, we're leading the way. Um, of course, we're all aware that the sickness could, could come again. We're not immune. Um, it's going to be a nerve-wracking period in the months ahead to see whether we manage to maintain our health as a country, as people. Um, but we've done well so far. And, of course, the government has um, gained hugely from, from its achievements here. Um, we've also had a sudden shift to social democracy with um, the government, as soon as the economic impacts of COVID became visible, Grant Robertson and James Shaw and company threw out the budget responsibility rules, which had been holding um, back all sorts of potential developments 
uh, here. Um, it was hard to imagine that only a short time ago they were so bound by those fiscal constraints. They, they're gone as a response to COVID. Um, so it's an interesting time. Labor's well over 50% in the polls, unheard of in the MNP era, and the smaller parties like New Zealand First and the Greens are under considerable threat. The Labor Green government has done some good things, including getting rid of the budget responsibility rules, um, the, the sequence of wage subsidies at $585 a week has been great, with up over 1.6 million workers um, getting the benefit of those subsidies. And we're now just about to enter the second stage of those. They've made apprentices, apprenticeships free across the board, um, with some other priority areas of training completely free, put a billion dollars into environmental job creation, and, and found housing for the street homeless, or at least some of them. And all of this is really good stuff. But there's a really big but here, because at the same time, while this is this has all been part of the outpouring of Jacinda's kindness, the message of kindness we've seen for some time now, um, outpouring of support, um, the sense of the team of five million, but underneath what's really going on, and I would suggest that not all of us are seen as part of that team of five million. Some of some examples of this, um, one that I just think is so abominable, has been the creation of, of a two-tier welfare system where <clears throat> people who are made unemployed as a result of COVID between the, from March onwards um, will receive four, $490 a week as a unemployment benefit payment. The people that were on unemployment or other forms of welfare support, but not for that reason, will remain on the same the same low benefits they've been forever. Um, so, for example, people on job seeker get two hundred and fifty dollars a week, and look with amazement at the four hundred and ninety some other unemployed workers are getting. And this is a real case of Labor, like National, both parties do it once again saying we have the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. And it feels pretty bad if you're a sole mum or an unemployed worker who, who was unemployed for other reasons or a person with sickness or disability or injury who's trying to survive and seeing this very, uh, this very distinction, class distinction in the welfare system being created so overtly. And funnily enough, just over the period um, that leads up to October, so it's going to last till just after the election, and I think we can all see some reasons for that. A second place where they're creating uh, this real division in how people are treated is with stranded migrant workers. There's, there's many, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of migrant workers here in this country. And the government is doing very little for them. Some of them are receiving a bit of emergency relief through uh, civil defence and emergency management. Some are receiving help from charity, from, from food banks um, and other charitable organisations. Um, but it could, the government could be doing so much more. There's one clause in the Social Security Act which allows um, in a pandemic uh, that uh, migrant workers could be paid Social Security benefits right now, but the government refuses to use it which means that we have this whole group of people who are being treated as disposable, which is what often happens to migrants in times of crisis. But it's really shameful that a government that preaches kindness uh, should not be uh, treating people kindly just because um, they come from somewhere else and we've used them when we needed them. And now they can be left to the side. Another area where there's... Um, a sh there's a noticeable divide is in this all this talk and support for what is called shovel ready projects and so many of them some of, some of them very worthy don't know about all the big roading projects but a lot of the environmental roading construction and so on this constant talk about shovel ready has an underpinning um there's an underpinning idea there that what we're really talking about is work for young fit people and particularly for young fit men. And I'd love to see a lot more focus on job creation that was suitable for women 
for people that aren't hyper physically fit, for people that are older, for people with disability, um, for people who have skills and experience and heaps to offer in all sorts of areas <laughs> that aren't necessarily um, people that aren't necessarily able to go out and um, plant those trees or build those roads or build those houses, much as we do need all that work, um, or some of it. Uh, there's, there's a real patriarchal and there's real questions around patriarchy and disability going on here. I'm also concerned about um, about the capacity of the state sector to deal with the major shifts and priorities that are needed right now. Um, there's a huge loss of institutional knowledge in the public sector over the last decades, a loss of the sense of um, of of serving the public and of having institutional memory of what's happened in the past, very high turnover and a lack of, um, under, when you have young graduates not politically tainted, employed by your departments, how much do they really understand about the needs of the unemployed, of migrant workers, of, of so much of what's really going on in the economy and society? How well is our government itself, the government, services of governments itself placed to deal with what's happening? Um, and we also, at the same time, is that problem. We have councils like, for example, the biggest city, Auckland, um, talking about job losses, redundancies, asset sales, at a time when we actually need more public services, not, not fewer. And I don't know if there's any willingness of government to recognise how deep the need of many of our local councils will be for support at this time. So overall, the overall picture I'm seeing is one of a lack of willingness to go further in a whole lot of areas. And a talk about kindness and empathy, but at the same time creating even more equities as they go along. <clears throat> We've also got the, co uh, the context here of um, ongoing racism and colonisation. Um, it was... Um, Inspiring to see some of the responses of iwi during the COVID lockdown, including in the area where I live in Te Taipokoro, um, with iwi setting up their own health checkpoints, um, making sure that particular areas that suffered hugely in the epidemics of the past were protected this time, working alongside other health groups and police in the local communities to ensure that everyone was protected in these areas, not only Māori, but everyone who lived in the north. The same sort of things were happening on the east coast as well. A cure to everyone involved in that. That was a real example of mana motahaki in action, and one I think we can be in, really inspired and learn from. We've also seen just in the past week the massive rally in Auckland supporting Black Lives Matter in the States and other rallies around the country. I think this is a sign of, sh of a shift too, um, that we're standing here in solidarity with what's happening um, in America, but also drawing the links with racism and colonisation in our own country. But of course, as we all know, systemic institutional racism continues all over the place. Um, as well as the challenge from Māori to us, those of us who come from a settler Pākehā background or a tauiwi, that is foreigners in this country, the challenge for constitutional transformational reform led by the Mataki Mai initiative um, of, of a few years ago in which Māori went through a, a, a very big process to put together their ideas for a better trans, uh, constitutional future for this country but we Pākehā, we Tawiwi have never responded to that in the way we should, or the way we could. <clears throat> so when it comes to expanding our horizons, um, I don't want to talk too much about, dwell too much on what's bad is, is what I've, I've been doing just now, um, because it gets pretty depressing. Um, and it's not really why I'm here today, to add to that anxiety that so, so many of us feel as a result of recent and current events. Um, we, don't, we don't need to spend all our time critiquing the government or looking at what's happening overseas. We do need to seize this moment to push our political dreams and our ambitions for a fear of better Aotearoa. I'm also one of the many of us right now, who, and I think there are more of us than we realise, 
who would like to push our vision of a future past what is possible um, with the current political parties we have in our parliament. Um, they're all very confined by the neoliberal agenda. So how do we move our political dreams past what might be seen as possible within the current parliamentary framework? Um, how can we push past what's acceptable to capitalism and beyond the confines of our settler history? The seeds of that lie in what we work for now, both in what we aim for and how we do the work of coming together to achieve that change. And that's what I mean when I talk about expanding our horizons. It's about pushing the bounds of political possibility and not just accepting what is um, or accepting just good enough or that we're going to return to some kind of normal because I don't think there is, there is no normal to which we're going to return after COVID. Oops. <clears throat> and I think also part of this is looking at what are the useful opportunities that have arisen as a result of COVID and its impacts. We've, had, we've all had time to think. Um, we've had quite a lot of time at home lately. And I hope we haven't just been spending that in front of, of the TV or um, having to keep trying to do our work in our workplace, but also in our workplace at home if we've had work. Um, but also time to think about what's going on and consider things a little more deeply than we do at times. We've, we've certainly had a lot of webinars and lectures and panels, um, like the series that we're, that, that's happening right now tonight. Um, and in a lot of that, um, I think we are looking to where are the opportunities, where, where are the trigger points, where are the cracks in capitalism, where are the cracks in the system that have been opened up and exposed by the COVID crisis that we can utilise, that we can make the most of in some of the areas in which we work. And I'm just going to talk about a few of those areas now, the, the places um, with which I'm particularly familiar. And the first of these is with welfare. <clears throat> as it, a very sad thing that we all know about is that we have many, many newly unemployed people. Um, and it's forecast that hundreds of thousands more people will become jobless over the coming months. And the numbers are going up by the day as we watch with horror the, the redundancies that are being made. Um, the, and the people, not only the redundancies that are being made, but the people perhaps who have just graduated or trained in an area and can't get work. Um, people who had expected to have jobs and don't have them. Um, but for those that are coming out of the regular workforce, um, they're suddenly finding uh, that the benefit system might not be quite what they imagined it was. They may have spent their life thinking that there were all these people sitting there on welfare, having a jolly good time, but suddenly realised that um, if you're not a recipient of the new $490 a week payment, you're only going to get $250 a week, that you're going to be judged in terms of income on the state of your relationship. If you're in a relationship with someone, um, you might not be eligible for anything. Um, these sort of realities um, are and will be a shock to many of the newly unemployed. So this is a time when if that uh, new awareness, that conscientizing of people who are not used to being treated as people are treated by work and income, who are not used to having to live on an amount of money that is totally below what is needed to survive, that this is a chance for us to really push hard to change the welfare system in a transformational way. And we're lucky because we've got the blueprint. We've got a blueprint already. In 2017, the government set up a Welfare Expert Advisory Group, the WEAG. It reported back in 2018 with well over 100 recommendations, only three of which have been even partially implemented. It sat there as something the government paid a lot of money to achieve, but they paid very little attention to it. So we have a blueprint for major reform. It could happen now, um, but they're just not touching it. Even more than that, um, we have the possibility, I think, in this time of moving to a basic income, what is often called a universal basic income, but which some of us prefer these days to call a basic income or a guaranteed basic income. Um, 
again, this has been a topic of much discussion. I think um, I've never seen it talked about so much before in New Zealand since we came to the COVID crisis. So again, if not now for basic income, when? Because a lot of people are not um, that familiar with basic income and because there are different forms of it, I will just run very briefly um, through what I think are some of the prerequisites for a progressive basic income. Because I think there are, there are dangers here too in that there are proponents of basic income who can come from a very right-wing perspective on it um, or from the middle somewhere, or people who say it's not left or right. Um, but for me, basic income is, unless it's got these conditions, um, it's a very dangerous thing, because you could get people who say, well, we'd love to pay everyone the same, but at a very low amount, that would be even less than what people get on welfare now, and goodness knows that's nowhere near enough. So we do have to be careful when talking about it. So some of the characteristics of a progressive basic income are that it's enough to live on um, and that um, it should there should be supplements for each child and um, for people with disabilities and for age by like people of superannuation age it needs to be paid regularly in an ongoing way um, it shouldn't be a one-off payment and I think again we've seen overseas the idea and actually the payment of what they call helicopter payments that's no answer just throwing um, $1,200 at someone um, is nice as an interim thing, oh, that, but does nothing for long-term sustainability of an individual or of a family. Payment also needs to be made in cash. People need to be able to control their payment. Um, it needs to be on an individual basis. That is, every adult treated as an individual, not... Um, given income on the basis of the relationship they're in, which is the position in our current welfare system. There should be no means testing or sense of reciprocal obligations. Um, because, as I mentioned here, um, part of the beauty of basic income is that it's an unconditional payment, and it allows, in a way, some valuing in money of the unpaid work, all the unpaid work that happens in our homes every day with raising children, looking after older people, um, all the unpaid work people do in the marae and local communities to keep their rohe going, all that work we do in community, all that wonderful creative work that can happen, that deserves to be paid. And basic income is the answer to that if it's enough to live on. <clears throat> if we had basic income, it would also lead to a rise in respect for all those essential workers we've been talking a lot about during covid those people that work in the supermarkets, that do our cleaning, that care for older people, that um, del deliver, uh, delivery drivers and truck drivers, so many people that are paid such a bondable wages and treated so badly often enough at the moment. Um, in fact, with a basic income, workers like that would have a much stronger bargaining point because we want someone that cl to clean the toilet. That's not a very desirable job. Okay, well, we just have to pay a bit more for that. I think that a basic income would in fact strengthen the ability of workers to bargain in the paid workforce, um, while at the same time valuing that unpaid work and getting, it would also give us the opportunity to get rid of the oppressive and punitive welfare system we currently have. There are sadly some commentators and activists on the left who at the moment say we shouldn't pursue a basic income right now, that we should be citizen, such as those put up in the WEAG report. I say to them, yes, that I can't we go to a basic income? Why settle for less through arguments that, um, that say, well, we can't do it, I don't, or we, there's too many conditions? And I think some of those arguments are around how we pay for it. But I think with a progressive basic income alongside a high progressive income tax and other wealth taxes, it becomes part of a package alongside a commitment to access to jobs. When we put that all together, it is part of the shape of a far better, fairer future, a redistributive future that will work for all of us, not just some of us. Yeah. <clears throat>
Even without a shift to basic income, the rise in unemployment and the urgency of the climate crisis provide an opportunity to look and to alter it the way, the way, some of the ways we look at work in this country. Incomes need to lift. There's a gross disparity between those at the top and those at the bottom, which is even more apparent now. Um, figures on incomes are coming out, NCO incomes are coming out, um, and there are still massive gaps. In May, for example, it came out Auckland Council, there are 86 council staff paid more than $250,000 a year. It's incredible. Six of them on $500,000 or more. All of them men. We don't, we shouldn't have to just accept in our minds that this is a, how society should be. We need to lift incomes at the bottom and pull them down at the top. We should value unpaid work, as I've already discussed, not, but not only through the welfare system or through basic income, um, but, but also through changes like saying, why should sole, sole parents be forced to go out to work? Why shouldn't um, parents be allowed to stay at home and look after their, their kids without um, having to be work tested? <clears throat> There's some people that oppose basic income but support the job guarantee scheme, putting these up as, as op in opposition to each other. Again, they don't, I don't believe they in any way need to be opposed to each other. Uh, some people may not have heard of job guarantee schemes. It's an idea that I think comes out of America. It's certainly proposed a lot by de some of the Democrats over there. Um, and it's part of the Democratic uh, Green New Deal. It means government support for jobs that are paid at least the minimum wage, though a living wage would be preferable, um, and that provide uh, useful work for government, for local government or for community. Um, and where I stand, that fits in right beside basic income, not against it. Um, we do need support for community-led, community-based job creation here, doing all that good house and housing, environmental work, other socially and environmentally useful initiatives. Um, it, this opens the way to us building our own people's economic basis providing work at decent wages that needs doing, not just those big roading projects, not just the think big type projects that are going on right now. We need a lot more investment into what, in, into enabling the community sector, iwi and tangata whenua groups um, to create our own jobs, co experiment with cooperative forms of employment um, and build our own bases, creating jobs, doing the work that needs done, doing. Housing, again, so many jobs can be created there at the same time as meeting one of our biggest social needs. Um, with, we should also even perhaps be thinking and talking a lot more about nationalisation or renationalisation, or in some cases local government ownership. Not only for thing, the very obvious things like Air New Zealand, but also in areas like health and ageing, disability care, forestry. How about a Ministry of Works? How about building, literally building our own houses rather than um, contracting that out to private developers all the time. How about um, creating our own jobs in public transport and food redistribution and food rescue, ecological nurturing. Some of that is starting to happen, but so much more could if we had a government and a system that enabled us to be let free to create the good work that can happen. I've been inspired by a little example that came to light in the last few days, and some of you may have seen this already. There's a group in Hawaii called the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, and they've issued a policy program that puts women at the centre of the response to COVID. And some of the things that they've come up with are what they call universal basic income, free publicly funded childcare for essential workers, sorry about the spelling here. Um, they, they're demanding a $25 an hour minimum wage for sole, for sole parents and paid work, and that is that wage is in US dollars. Um, public fund, emergency funds for high risk groups that wouldn't get 
welfare or support in other ways in the, in, in Hawaii. So that would be groups including what we'd see here as strand and migrant workers. Um, I love this one. They call for a major investment into midwifery, something that's so badly needed in this country, but it seems to have been left behind again, despite um, a lot of the stories that came out during the COVID crisis, and despite the never the, the bottomless um, the, a pit of, of um, need that sits out in our communities for, for adequate support for midwifery here. Um, and overall, they've called for 20% of their COVID response recovery funds to go directly to Hawaiian Indigenous communities. And I'm just, this is not all that their program calls for. You can see the reference there. But I just think it's interesting running up that up against some of the demands we might be making here in this country. Um, the on, our ongoing work, we can never forget the work that um, we Pākehā and other Tauri, we need to do on race to move beyond, to fight racism and to move beyond colonialism here. Um, to, we, we need all these jobs that have always been with us need to continue and should be part of how we shape our future. Um, to learn the true history of this country, to act as allies for Māori and struggle, um, to to make a response to race, understand and make a response to racism wherever we find it, and not use excuses, and not not shy away from that when we come across it, um, and and to and to do more to understand the ecological and other values that that Māori are generous enough to share with us um, as we work together. To try and change this country. It's the same with the climate. I apologise in a way for not talking more about climate justice and, and the need um, issues around climate change here tonight. But again, this is a huge area um, that has to be integrated across everything else we do. Um, we need to find solutions to the climate crisis and ecological loss in ways that are effective and meaning, meaningful that don't continue the never-ending capitalist war on the poor and that tie across every area of the economy and society. And when we're looking for our solutions, when we're looking at our vision and when we're looking at implementing a way forward from public transport and energy, from farming to housing, conservation and water, Greenpeace and other groups have done some good work in this area, of course. Um, but it's up to all of us to meld between the social and economic, between the climate and environmental sector, and with a, with a grounding in treaty justice as well, as we begin to shape this new future. <clears throat> Hope is absolutely critical to inspiring ourselves and others to do the hard work of activism, of group and movement building. And without some idea of where we're heading, it's pretty hard to build that hope. If we haven't got something to offer others, people aren't going to work with us to build that new future. And as I started out saying at the beginning, we need to co-create that vision in Kaupapa. Find ways to do it, not as individuals or the whole heap of bright ideal ideas, but in collective ways. And we do have, a, and there are examples around, I've just put a few of them here. Um, one of them, of course, is the Matake Mai process itself that was um, led by, by um, Māori um, and totally um, carried out by Māori, in which they held a, a huge number of hui across the country um, with, with people everywhere, with young people, with, even with people in prison, um, creating their vision of, of how this country could be, how we could have a decolonised Aotearoa with constitutional transformation um, coming out of the co-creation of many, many hui, many, many processes of people working together in all sorts of ways to create this vision um, to, which, um, the, to which we now need to respond. Another example, a much smaller one, but that I was part of in 2010, along with um, friends in the church and the community sectors, was the, as a response to national uh, um, bringing in really terrible uh, welfare reforms at that time. Um, a group of organisations came together and set up an alternative welfare working group, 
um, where a group of us went out around the country and held hui in meetings with beneficiaries and people from the community and listened to what they had to say about what was happening with welfare at the time, their ideas about the solutions. We then brought that together, looked at all the, invested quite an academic research and investigation background as well, and brought together both what we'd heard from people around the country and the necessary uh, research background, brought that together into a couple of books and came up with a series of recommendations and analysis, which I think still stand as part of a contribution to um, change as potential of potential ways of changing the way we look at work with welfare in this country. And that actually became a contribution to the government's welfare working group later on. Another project I was part of um, further back was called Building Our Own Future. And I, I'm not, for anyone that knows about that project, I'm not saying that we should in any way replicate what happened back in that time, but it was an exciting project that happened over a whole year and involved things like people meeting in local communities to have what we call people's assemblies to look at the creation of a people's charter uh, that would bring together the hope, the hopes and the vision of a lot of us around the country, around the sort of things I've been talking about and the sort of kaupapa that I've been talking about today. And we did that not just through having regional meetings in people's assemblies, but also a lot of, of sectoral groups, um, whether it was unemployed and beneficiaries, trade unions, um, people active in the churches, people, young student activists, um, people working in housing and many different areas, we came together to co-construct both concrete activity and a whole lot of projects, but also a people's charter. And I think there's something from a project like that um, that we can also learn for now. Um, the work of creating manifestos and visions of the future together is inspiring and can be a lot of fun as well. And I think that work is important. And um, But at the same time, um, a vision and creating a vision is no use without the organisation to back it. And you can't actually do the work of creating vision without organisations. So I'm just going to turn to the second part of this talk and um, the last part of this talk and just put forward a few ideas about making solidarity meaningful and how we can build more strongly in this time. Some of the things I've learned about how we can build groups the importance of linking the individual difficult circumstances that people are in, whether it's as an unemployed person or a family um, in desperate poverty or a stranded migrant worker, um, whoever we're working with, um, that we work with them, not see them as less than. And certainly in the unemployed groups I've been part of, the importance, for example, of not seeing people as clients or customers, but as people, as our fellow humans, that we work with to create change and starting from that place of solidarity rather than from a place of saying, I, is this somehow this political uh, evangelical person, this, uh, this person that knows more than you, I'm here to show you the way. If we work like that, we're never going to get anywhere. Um, we have to find ways and work in ways that are truly about solidarity. Um, part of that is through... Um, sharing, working in our groups to find a kaupapa that we share. Um, this is the vision for the group itself, rather than the bigger sense of vision I was talking about before. Um, always looking at how we can do more to educate ourselves and the people we work for, learn from people's own experiences. Um, it's important that we have the will to act, not just to talk, not just to be on social media. Um, to, but to learn how to talk well, to write well, that language matters and that it's really important that we speak in language that other people, that ordinary people, the people we work with can understand, that we don't speak in ways that just go over people's heads. Um, in our groups, one of the things um, that I, as I get older, um, I can see it is so important and it's still so hard for us to learn that alongside having a shared kaupapa in an organisation, it's so important um, that we have a way of working together that respects the others in our group, that we respect each other, that we find ways of working that 
acknowledge the value of each person, of what they bring to a group, an organisation or a movement, um, not just some of us, and that how we build those relationships is all important because if we don't do that, the groups will break and the relationships break and we lose the lot. Um, and another kind of relationship building, the importance of trying to reach out our, to each other across the things that normally divide us, whether it's between the universities and the activist on the street, whether it's between employed workers and unemployed workers, between, um, oh, there are many different ways that we're divided, and um, we're very good at it on the left, but it's finding the will to bridge those divides and to respect the different ways in which we make change. I see some big organisational gaps at the moment, um, and I'm sure you will see some too. Just a few, a few of the ones that I'm particularly um, thinking about just now. Um, the first is obviously, I guess, in the area of unemployed workers' organisation at a time when unemployment is going through the roof. As someone who lived through the unemployment crisis of the 80s and 90s, um, in the 80s unemployment went up um, massively uh, under the last years of the Muldoon government and then with Rogernomics and the right-wing revolution that came through um, from in the, in the 80s um, with hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs, as is happening now. We had up to, at that time, we had up to 31 unemployed and beneficiary activist groups during those years. Now there are not really any unemployed workers activist groups at all. <laughs> so we're starting again in a different era and I don't know what organisational form is going to work in this time. We have the seeds of groups in places like Auckland Action Against Poverty and some other places where beneficiaries advocate for others, for other people in the same situation. Um, we have the seeds of it in trade unions that um, try and reach out their hands to redundant and unemployed workers and unions that support the struggles of migrant workers. I see the seeds of unemployed workers organisation, um, but uh, I think there's going to be a lot of work that can and should happen in this area and a lot of potential to make change. But the, the, there's no existing uh, national structure, much less any local structure, and you can't have a national movement or group without local groups, and those local groups simply aren't there in this generation at this time, so that's a big gap. Another one um, in a related area is um, in the capacity of unemployed workers and others to come together to build, um, to build or create jobs together, things like um, cooperative workers' organisation, uh, uh, yeah, co-ops for workers, um, community economic develop initi development initiatives at grassroots, where we create our own organisations from, from scratch, doing that kind of socially and environmentally and economically useful work that I talked about earlier. The, again, this was a sector that thrived in the 80s and 90s. There was far more, there was actually a whole government department that supported community economic development. It was called the Community Employment Group. Uh, Labor got rid of that in the 2000s. There was money there to support the initiatives of local groups to create their own jobs. Um, I'd love to see that kind of enabling coming from government and local government again, the willingness of government and local government to work alongside uh, those of us in the communities who would like to engage in that kind of job creation. Um, there's a lot more that could be done there. I know there is some there is some things going on, but there needs to be a lot more. A third um, a third area that has struck me for some years now is that with all the struggles around housing, we've never managed to pull together any kind of political united front that bridges the gaps between renters and those who own their own home or, or whose focus is on trying to own their own housing between the people who want to build little houses, between, <laughs> between the people who want to build um, community housing, um, those who are engaged um, in, rural, in the rural areas, um, those who are working with the homeless, with emergency housing and transitional housing. There are so many different aspects to the housing struggle. Um, I keep wondering if there is, if we can conceive of ways or begin to think of ways we could work together to, to present a much more united in a much more united way 
on the political aspects without taking away from any of the particular groups or fightbacks or or the good work that's happening already in all sorts of ways. It's not trying to undermine anything that already exists, but just um, trying to meld it across in a way that could be much more politically transformational. And the, another, the final big gap I'll talk about here is one some of you have probably heard me talk about before, which for, for some of us there is currently no political party that represents our vision of the future for Aotearoa. There's no political party that I can see that looks past capitalism or past colonialism to what could be, that has the capacity to build strongly to say this is a tauiri response to the challenge of Matake Mai. Because unless we have the political capacity at a large enough level to say we can be your partner, we can be your other house, um, <clears throat> we will not be able to respond to Mata K Mai. Yes, there, there are really good initiatives in Pākehā Treaty Education. Yes, there's a wonderful Facebook initiative, Pākehā Response, Tauri Response. But that's not going to mean anything unless we have a political form or forms that we can build to be that partner. Um, I also dream sometimes of a party or parties that start with women and with the needs and priorities of women and children at the centre, including Indigenous women and children. I think a, a woman-centred party could look quite different than the parties we currently see in Aotearoa or have seen in the past. Not, I'm not talking about something that excludes men, but one which is all-inclusive of, of all people, but starts at the place of um, where, where the heart the heart and the strength and the power of women and the needs of women and children beat really strongly and can't be subsumed and undermined as we continue to be in so many places of power and stop us moving forward more effectively. <clears throat> there are some really hard issues of our time of our time, I think, that we continue to grapple with. For example, one of our biggest problems um, is that we're always looking for the worst in people. How can we stop um, using online communications as a way of, of beating each other up, of calling each other out, that whole culture where anything we say that's wrong um, gets called out so that we end up fearing being able to, to even speak on anything at all. I can see that affecting me, um, and I'm quite a strong person <laughs> who's been active a long time, and I know others who go silent online because of that fear um, of saying something wrong. Um, we need to acknowledge this and find ways to work with it and work past it so that we don't have social... So social media isn't a place that fractures us so much. We have to, um, I see all too often on the left people also attacking unions, again, including online, because unions aren't perfect. Of course, there's heaps of problems with unions, and, and including inside particular unions, but organised labour and the power of unions remains in some ways our last bulwark against um, the powers that, are up, that, that we are ranged against, um, the power of capital, the power of the political system that holds up capital. Without unions, we would be totally bereft. And, and I think we need to think more when we mount these, um, what I'd call thoughtless attacks on unions. It's not that we can't criticise. It's not that we shouldn't work to change or improve um, the, the workings of a union that we might be a member of. Of course, we can work to improve things. Um, but let's not, let's be a bit careful about where we place our criticism. <laughs> and think about who our real friends are. An internal, entire, and there's a question around internal, internally how we organise as well. Um, the importance of internal, greater internal democracy and trust inside our groups, of creating structures which allow us um, to include a diversity of people inside them so that we don't break apart as groups as soon as there's division. To have structures that are strong enough to allow internal debate, real, genuine debate, where we don't shy away from debate, 
because we fear it, because it might fracture us, but where we can include, where we can have real debates and include people who might be challenging, might be challenging to us. But unless we can include a variety and diversity of people, again, we're not going to be able to build our strength. The last one of these hard issues I'm going to talk about now is the mistrust between generations. Um, we, <clears throat> there's been at times there's very simple generalisations that can be made about generations. For example, that oh, younger people in their teens and twenties only care about individualism and consumerism, or the one about older folks that they're all well off, that they're self-satisfied. They're uncaring. They don't give a damn about making real change. They only care about themselves and they've got it sorted. These kind of generalisations are not helpful. <laughs> I think we would all be a lot much stronger if we can recognise, understand, take the time to, to really cross those generational lines, to learn from each other um, and to work with each other to, to make the most of what the energy and the excitement and strength and knowledge and wisdom of youth that added to the wisdom and knowledge and experience of the older folks and all those in between. Together, we are so much stronger when we aren't tearing each other up. So just a, a few of the hard issues to think about. And in conclusion, oops, <coughs> we are, we are, <coughs> sorry, we are imperfect humans. And in making change, our praxis is never going to be perfect. It's a matter of keeping on rehearsing for a future we want to live, knowing that the rehearsing is actually the revolution that we want to make. There's no use waiting for some magic moment when everything will be perfect. It's important to dream. We don't want not to dream, but we can't allow the idea that we can only act once we are pure or perfect to stop us from taking action. There is a place in between, a pragmatism of working things out as we go along. I think that we can all feel the heightened hope and opportunity of this time. Neoliberal capitalism and the era of colonisation are shuddering under the impacts of the climate crisis, the COVID crisis and the economic crisis resulting from COVID. It is up to us, it's on us to keep up keep up and build on the exciting and hopeful work that is already happening in this country and around the world. Kia ora to all of you for taking the time out to watch or listen to this tonight. The, a different kind of future is in our hands. Kia kaha, kia manawanui, kia maunga.